2014, there was a real danger that Scotland was going to leave the Queen's beloved British family when Prime Minister David Cameron agreed to call a referendum on Scottish independence. The ballot was to be held in September. She's in Balmoral in a Highland retreat, and by coincidence, her annual stay at Balmoral is coinciding with the independence referendum campaign. In early 2014, the campaign to leave had been trailing in the polls. But by the time the Queen came to Balmoral for her summer break, the Scottish nationalists had narrowed the lead. In the last couple of weeks, the yes campaign and the no campaign were effectively neck and neck. There is a real sense of emergency taking hold in London, and a sense too that the Queen actually could be the ace for the, for the UK campaign, that she's the person that's actually going to have to intervene to make absolutely certain that they were going to win the no vote. Despite all of her instincts to stay out of the race, despite, despite all of her instincts that it's not constitutionally proper, there is an immense amount of pressure being brought to bear on her. Just four days before the referendum, the Queen made an unprecedented comment. Veteran reporter Jim Lawson was, as usual, covering her Balmoral stay. We were in a normal place, corralled outside the church grounds. After about half an hour, a policeman came down and said, would you like to come up to the church? That was unheard of, you know. We actually wondered what was going on. And I thought, I wonder if she's going to approach the crowd. As she did, one of the bystanders mentioned the referendum. The Queen said, well, I hope people will think very carefully about the future. The bystander was happy to tell Jim the Queen's comment, but curiously wouldn't give him their details. If the Queen talks to someone, they're always delighted to tell you, but not this time. Some wondered whether the bystander had been planted in the crowd. Others thought it was just a chance comment. Either way, the newspapers needed to corroborate the story with Buckingham Palace. The palace didn't confirm it, but more importantly, they didn't deny it. We knew we were onto some story there. Now, if you translate that to your standing on the edge of the cliff and the Queen says to you, think very carefully about what you're about to do, she's not advising you to jump, is she? Newspaper editor Severin Carell felt the comment was the result of a lot of thought. One could read it either way. And as in that sense, it was very, very, very carefully written, very cleverly written. But we realised that the Queen had made a quite deliberate and quite carefully drafted interjection. She had intervened into the referendum campaign. On Thursday, the 18th of September, 2014, Scotland went to the polls. The majority of the people voting have voted no to the referendum question. I have worked so hard to save Scotland because I'm a proud Scot and I'm a proud Brit. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's been a pretty fair kick of the ball. For now, the Queen's United Kingdom was intact. But this wouldn't be the last time that her position would be used in politicians' arguments. In 2016, David Cameron held the second referendum of his prime ministership. This time, the question was to leave or remain in the European Union. On Monday, I will commence the process set out under our Referendum Act, and I will go to Parliament and propose that the British people decide our future in Europe. In the charged atmosphere of the EU debate, it was perhaps inevitable that someone would try to involve the Queen in their argument. Thomas Newton Dunn is political editor of The Sun, he was tipped off about a conversation between the Queen and European Union supporter Nick Clegg. Well, I was told a, a most fascinating story by a, a impeccable source uh, of an extraordinary row during a, a lunch she held in Windsor Castle. And so this is going back 2011, 2012 now. Uh, they ended up discussing Europe. Uh, the Queen ended up getting to quite a lively dust-up with the Deputy Prime Minister, who was a very strong uh, pro-European politician. The Queen was putting forward some very strong views uh, on the, the future shape of Europe and the direction which Europe was going in. The Sun wasn't only planning to report the alleged conversation, but to boost it by quoting prominent Brexiteers. This led to their infamous headline. Queen backs Brexit came from 
ringing up a couple of Tory MPs to, to find out what they thought about it, uh, and some of the very passionate Brexiteer MPs leaped on the suggestion that we might be pretty Eurosceptic to say, well, in which case, that must mean she backs Brexit. But very closely written underneath was bombshell claim, because of course it was these MPs claim she must back Brexit rather than ours. When Downing Street found out that The Sun was going to run with the headline, they began to investigate the source of the story. So when I first saw the Queen Backs Brexit headline, I wanted to see very quickly, well, what was this based on? And it seemed to be at a lunch that had been many years before. How could she back up something several years before when it wasn't even a term that was invented or even something that was seen as a particular possibility? Nick Clegg strongly denied the story. I think it's appalling that people who want to drag the United Kingdom out of the European Union uh, now want to drag the Queen into the European referendum debate. And as for the, the Sun story, it's nonsense. It is not true. I couldn't be clearer than that. The palace thought that the headline was misleading and immediately lodged a complaint to the Independent Press Standards Organization. At the time, the palace said they were extremely angry uh, and the Queen is never to be dragged into politics and they're now going to put a stop to it by making a formal complaint. They wanted to draw a line in the sand and, and to extricate the Queen from any more uh, political rows. Ipso upheld the complaint, saying the headline went further than the claim about what the Queen might think. The Sun was forced to print its ruling, but by then, the whole story had fueled the Brexit debate. I don't know that you could necessarily say that it persuaded people to vote for Brexit, but I think it was certainly another tick in the column of people who wanted to leave the EU. We know from occasional slippages that she obviously does have personal political opinions, but in public, in terms of aura, she exudes impartiality. She exudes being what a constitutional monarch should be above politics, above opinion. As head of state, the Queen has battled to stay out of politics, but at times she needs to be at the forefront of Britain's national events and disasters. In 2017, the world woke up to one of the most shocking tragedies of recent times, the Grenfell Tower fire. Where the fire was now spreading, people were reaching out from the front window, trying to grasp a bit of fresh air, trying to breathe. They looked like they were struggling. It was harrowing, torturing screams for help. It was honestly like a horror movie. When the fire got to its peak point, I could actually hear a man screaming, and then all of a sudden, the screaming just stopped. In the past, the Queen has been criticised for her slow response. In the 60s, she waited eight days before visiting the victims of the Abba Van disaster, an accident in a Welsh mining town which claimed the lives of 28 adults and 118 children. It was a sort of lesson for us all that you have the need to show sympathy and to be there on the spot, which I think people craved from her. In her later reign, she's made sure that she makes a rapid response. Just 48 hours after the Grenfell Tower disaster, the Queen came to see the relief effort. One of the first charities to help at Grenfell was the British Red Cross. Mike Adamson is their chief executive. I think the visit of the Queen showed that the nation stood in solidarity with the community at Grenfell and that that community had not been forgotten and people wanted to express their empathy um, for the experience that they had had. And the Queen, I think, has a unique ability to do that because of the way in which she conducts herself with such dignity and a sort of quiet, caring approach. And she went immediately to greet people, um, to say hello and how are you? And this was a big event affecting a lot of people in our country. She just showed her sympathy and empathy and tried to reach out. and. Um, wanted to be there to help. It was very moving. It's actually bringing tears to my eyes. Um, to see her here, it shows that she is sincere and she truly cares. She looked at me directly in my eyes and I could see that she cares. Thank you for coming. Thank you. The Queen's entire reign has presented her with many difficult moments. But the 2010s also held happier times for the 90-year-old monarch. 
as a new generation of royals came to the forefront to support her. In 2011, the Queen prepared to host one of the most iconic royal events of her reign. Her grandson and second in line to the throne, Prince William, married his university sweetheart, Catherine Middleton. It was a significant moment for the Queen's succession. The media are terribly excited about a royal wedding. The transparent happiness of the young couple just permeated right through the occasion, and that must have absolutely delighted the Queen. Marriage is vital to the royal family. It's about stability. It's the fact that you're going to continue down the generations. It's all about passing on the genes. Billions around the world tuned in for Kate and William's wedding. The popularity of the Queen and her family had never been so high. Not very long after that arrives Prince George, and so she then has her three heirs in direct succession. You have to go right back to Queen Victoria to find that situation. With Prince Harry marrying Meghan Markle, the dynasty is more secure than ever. The Queen has a very special relationship with all her grandchildren, particularly Prince William. It was the Queen herself who gave Prince William his constitutional history lessons. And when he becomes king, uh, it is in her constitutional style that he proposes to reign. I think the Queen and her grandchildren are all very close and she takes great interest in them and they're getting to the age now when they want to help. But it always makes me cross that people concentrate so much on Prince William and forget the fact that he's not the heir to the throne that the Prince of Wales is. Prince Charles's style is in stark contrast to his mother. While she tries to remain politically neutral, her son has always made his views very clear. Prince Charles consciously set out to take advantage of the relative constitutional freedom that a Prince of Wales has, as opposed to the monarch, to push the causes that he believes in. Therefore, he has felt it totally within his remit to write letters lobbying unashamedly prime ministers, ministers, members of the Church of England, bishops, to get his point of view across. He didn't write me that many letters, but when he did, they were perfectly sensible things. I mean, and he would be, they were much more in the sense of saying, look, I've been talking to people, for example, about countryside issues, or they might be about defense questions, and certainly around issues to do with climate change, the environment, and so on. Does it undermine the independence of the monarchy? No, I, I, I certainly didn't find that. He seems to have proclaimed that this is going to continue once he becomes king, and he believes he can rule in a different constitutional style from his mother. He will do very well, but you know, I think that's all in the future. But I, I, I don't think one else to be under any delusion of the fact that this will, this will be a great task. As the Queen continues into her 90s, Prince Charles has begun to take on more of his mother's responsibilities. On Remembrance Sunday 2017, he laid the wreath at the Cenotaph as head of the armed forces, it's one of the Queen's most symbolic duties and points to a changing of the guard. One of the Queen's most important legacies will also be the Commonwealth. In an era that might otherwise have seen the disappearance of things monarchical, she brought it into the 21st century. You can't quantify it. She really has been part of the invisible glue holding it together. And the Commonwealth, in turn, has valued her energy, her commitment, her good humor, and her enjoyment of it enormously. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister of Canada, for making me feel so old. <laughs>
In 2018, there was confirmation that Prince Charles will succeed the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. It was the latest in a series of landmark events for the royal family in just a few years. In July 2013, Prince George was born to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. For the first time since the reign of Queen Victoria, there was a monarch and three generations of direct successors to the throne, Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George. Suddenly you have this wonderful four-tier royal family because there's the Queen and Prince Philip still very much out and about and, and operating. You have Prince Charles doing his own thing with Camilla, and then you have the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, what I, what I think of as a slightly more informal, um, younger, you know, the, the open shirt, if you like, uh, attitude to royalty. However, just a few years later, Prince Philip decided he could no longer be out and about and announced his retirement from public duty. In 2017, then 96 years old, he took the salute at Buckingham Palace as Captain General of the Royal Marines, his final solo public engagement after 65 years of service. Over the course of a life that has spanned more than nine decades, the Queen's history has been our history. She has been the only monarch that most of us have ever known. She has breathed new life into the monarchy. Can you imagine the Georges uh, deciding um, that they had to open up Buckingham Palace? Can you imagine Victoria doing walkabouts? Historians of the future will look back on her years of office as one of the most transformative periods in the history of the monarchy. She has been the very essence of what a constitutional monarch should be, a lesson, not just to Britain, but to the, the world as a whole. That here in the 21st century, a monarchy can work. We don't think of inherited privilege when we think of Elizabeth II. We think of a woman who's done her job bloody well. Britain's longest serving monarch has seen a time of unprecedented change. She's transformed from shy Lilibet to head of the nation and a world leader. She's also had a very interesting time. I mean, she's met over the years everybody. Uh, from Mandela to all the American presidents, you know. I think that she has enjoyed being queen. We've lived through the most extraordinary times of enormous change, but we've had this thread of total stability with the queen and Prince Philip. They're, they're you know, the rocks in a very stormy sea. Anybody who's had the privilege of meeting the Queen will know that it's one of those life-defining moments. Um, she is absolutely lovely. There's a wonderful blue twinkle to her. She's got a very dry sense of humour. I can't think of anybody who I know who's met her and who has not been completely blown away by the experience. She is the sovereign and for, has been for a very long time. And to her, that's her life and her dedication. And she's never let us down, and she's not going to. I met the Queen first when I was 12 years old, and I have never, ever come away from a meeting with her. And one doesn't feel that you are in the presence of someone truly exceptional. They will be very, very big shoes to fill. Very big shoes. Queen Elizabeth II has steered her family through times of incredible happiness and crippling grief and loss. Her monarchy has been through crises, but she has managed to adapt and modernize. She's brought a special brand of magic to the House of Windsor. She's a woman driven by her duty to serve the British and Commonwealth peoples. Hers has been a remarkable reign and she will always be our queen. Good night and good luck to you all. Good luck to you all. Good luck to you all.